Muhammad Azadeen, Professor Azadeen, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him. Um, and, you know, we consider him as the mujaddid of our times, as a reformer of our times. And even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he talks about, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a mujaddid right, every century to reestablish the sunnah uh, and the, the Quran, you know, uh, to the believers. <coughs> Uh, so, alhamdulillah, we're going to be talking about this great personality, uh, <laughs> Professor Muhammad Azadeen, and the organization in which he established um, in 1938, Adinullah Universal Arabic Association. Um, and it's been established um, in Newark, New Jersey, uh, since 1938 upon. Uh, you, uh, vocals are back? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so we have uh, two distinguished panels panelists with us um, this evening. Um, Imam Ali Jabra, uh, he's the Imam of Masjid Dar Islam. Actually, we're, we're shooting live uh, from Masjid uh, Dar um, Islam um, here in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, and Imam um, Ali, he completed the intensive Imam training course at Medina uh, Muhammad Ibn Saud University, um, and we also have um, his brother. Um, uh, so this is my, my father and my uncle, uncle Abdullah, Abdullah, that's Abdullah, with us this evening, evening. Sheikh Muhammad Jabber. Jabber. Uh, he's, he's the, the author of Kalami Muslim. Muslim. He graduated from the Muhammad Ibn, Ibn Saud, Saud um, Imam, uh, Imam Training, training Seminary, Seminary College in Naperville, um, Illinois. Um, and we have, inshallah uh, ta'ala, a few honorable guests uh, that will be joining us um, and maybe bring us some insight on some aspects of the AAUAA. Uh, Sheikh Omar Mubarak, uh, Imam Daoud Adiola, uh, Brother Malik Abu Bakr, and Sheikh um, Anwar uh, Muhammad, inshallah ta'ala. If not uh, this part, uh, then some of them will be joining us in part two um, of this event, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so we're going to be covering certain things um, tonight. Um, so six topics. Number one, who was Professor Muhammad Azadeen? Number two, what did he accomplish in his travels to Egypt? Number three, which brand of Islam did he bring to America? And why did he claim the Hamitic Arab uh, identity? And what were the, the functions and activities of AAUAA, the Adinullah Universal Arabic Association, and lastly, what was the Uniting Muslim Society Conference of 1943? So, you can. So let's start, inshallah. Make sure uh, we can make sure make sure everyone is on mute, inshallah, uh, before we get into um, the questions and uh, uh, in the discussion. Um, so our first question uh, this evening is going to be directed to Imam um, Ali, um, and. Want us want you to actually enlighten us about uh, who was Professor Muhammad Azadeen. Bismillah, salatu salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa man wa lah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, we're talking about a huge project. Let's begin with Muhammad, Professor Muhammad Azuddin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him as being a pioneer, an educator, a husband, an organizer, a community builder, a trendsetter, and above all, a Muslim leader who espoused and propagated the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just just to get started. We have to remember that he was a southerner coming uh, to North America, coming to the to the northeast. 
And there, from there, he went to uh, Detroit, and there he began to do other things. I'm going to do it in different parts because most of this is about him and his works and his efforts. So I, my, my, my main purpose right now is just to introduce to you who you're dealing with, a person who had unprecedented efforts in establishing the Sunnah of Islam in America. He is unprecedented. There's no other records or other documentation that, that matches or parallels what he did in terms of bringing uh, Islam, meaning la ilaha illallah, wa Muhammad Rasulullah, meaning Islam, submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Tawheed, and also submitting and complying to obedience. So brothers and sisters, uh, we're going to come back to the subject. I just want you to remember that he was a trendsetter and a great organizer during the Depression. That's what, that's what I want to leave you on, is during the Depression, these things were taking place. From 1929 to 1939, he did some remarkable work and also uh, uh, the people around him. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah, and we, we know, know that, that um, Professor Mahaz as a dean, um, you know, he was part, initially he was part of the um, Morris Science Temple of America. Um, so if uh, Sheikh Mohammed, um, if you can kind of elaborate um, his role with the Morris Science Temple um, and what type of position does, did he actually hold um, with this particular organization? Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, uh, our uh, dear Sheikh, uh, Professor Muhammad Azadeen, uh, prior to uh, uh, embracing uh, Sunnah Islam, he was a part of the Moist Science Temple. Um, in fact, uh, through his diligence and his uh, efforts and sincerity, he was able to move up in the ranks and he was assigned the, uh, the governor of the uh, temple in Detroit. Uh, there he worked, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in a group effort with the uh, greater Moist Science Temple establishments. Uh, however, uh, in 1929, uh, Professor Ezri Muhammad began to uh, actually have different views about the uh, Moist Science Temple. In fact, uh, he actually uh, denounced, uh, announced his, uh, uh, his uh, disassociation and departure from them, which actually created a problem. One thing that's very unique about uh, Professor Muhammad Azadeen is that even before uh, he actually uh, left America, uh, he had uh, encountered other Muslims. And there are some collaborating uh, evidence that uh, Professor Azadeen Muhammad uh, encountered uh, a Sudanese uh, Muslim missionary in America by the name of get back in again. Uh, Majid. And uh, we are under the impression, based yeah, yeah, on uh, the information, nah, that the Majid had some home. impact on the aqidah or the beliefs that caused uh, Professor Ezzedine to change his views. He was known at that particular time by the name of Lomax Bay. Lomax Bay was the name that he carried inside of the Moorish Science Temple. Um, in fact, um, he uh, disassociated himself with the teachings or the doctrines of the Moorish Science Temple, he actually denounced uh, uh, their teachings and he also uh, made a public uh, announcement uh, that uh, uh, Drew Ali was not their leader, that he was the one that could actually uh, uh, guide them to correct uh, Islam. Uh, that created a problem. Uh, he was indicted for embezzlement uh, because he actually had began to start his own organization. He was uh, taken to court, there was a trial and through due process, he was exonerated, exonerated and that, that ended, ended his relationship with the Moorish Science Temple. Okay, alhamdulillah, barakallah, fikin. Um, so we want to kind of uh, see what happened after after this with uh, Professor uh, Ezzedine and of course, previously known as uh, Lomax Bay. Um, and we know that he traveled abroad um, and he traveled uh, to two countries in particular, uh, one was Turkey and the other was um, Egypt, right? So we want to kind of um, understand what did he actually accomplish uh, within these travels, um, in particular in, 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 uh, in Turkey, as well as in Egypt. What was the difference between uh, the, the, the two uh, countries that he actually visited, inshallah? Um, actually, um, Professor Ezzedine, rahimullah, 
he traveled to uh, Turkey, Turkey first uh, in 1930. Uh, his travel was not just a journey uh, to uh, fact finding or uh, uh, tourists. He went there as Hijra. He was actually uh, making a permanent migration, uh, escaping here in the United States at that particular time, what we call racial prejudice. Uh, as as uh, Imam Ali mentioned, this was a time of, uh, of depression. Uh, was, the uh, South was very, very challenged financially, the North, et cetera. And uh, he himself, along with about nine other individuals, made an exodus out of uh, America. And he's, he gained the title of the Black Moses because he was trying to uh, lead his people to a promised land. So he went to Turkey. As we know, Turkey was actually the last seat of the Islamic Caliph or the Khalifa. And he actually wrote a letter petitioning uh, Kamel uh, Ataturk and Pasha, uh, not only for a, a residence or asylum, but actually he petitioned him for a land grant to allow his followers uh, to actually build an American society inside of, uh, of uh, Turkey. And one thing is very important about that, uh, that exodus is that uh, he did not go as Lomax Bay. At that particular time, he changed his name to Muhammad uh, Ali. And, at, and also, he did not go as a Moor, so what is he as saying? a Muslim. He said you. that he was seeking uh, a, a promised land or seeking a, a, an asylum uh, for about 80 Muslim families. And he said there was about 2,800 Muslims that were waiting in America to escape racial prejudices. However, uh, it was a time of depression. Uh, and uh, Turkey it, as a country was going through a transition, uh, which is right out of uh, World War I. And there was a lot of problems there. They could not find, you know, the adequate accommodations uh, that they had expected, you know, in that particular society. So for a, period of, a short period of time, they lost hope and a lot of them returned. And Professor Ezzedine Muhammad, Rahimullah, he himself decided to continue his journey. And that's when he went into Egypt. Here in the strong line, before we, uh, make the transition to Egypt. Let's focus on uh, the title of being uh, resembled to the Muslim uh, Moses. Um, so, Imam Ali, um, if you could, if you could kind, kind of like, what is, what is the, the significance of this title? Because if you look at some of the newspaper clippings that are, that's shown on my screen, mm -hmm. this is what some of the the, the newspapers um, in Turkey actually labeled him. They actually they labeled him the, the Muslim Moses. So, what is the connection to the story of Moses, right, and his people to Professor Ezzedin um, and, you know, trying to find uh, a settlement in Turkey. Khaya, salam alaikum. One of the things we have to, to, to keep in mind is the time, the, the, the time that all of this has taken place. He left a country that we consider bondage, oppression, racism, and also at the time, Wall Street had collapsed. So who was at the bottom of the toe pole? Who was the last person to get any substance from America or any justice from America? And he had the insight to, to, to move forward because of his relationship, early relationship with the Turkish society in, uh, uh, was that Chicago or Detroit? Detroit. Detroit, uh, Detroit yes. There was Detroit. So, yeah. uh, uh, so he began to take advantages of all of these opportunities, even though uh, and they probably some families still there, yeah, no. but this is why <clears throat> this generation should pick up the mantle and continue to protect the legacy and the history of early Islam in America. Well, particularly when it refers to the indigenous people, people of color, color. Uh, uh, he didn't he just, just uh, make, make this history, but he was connecting them back to their ancient heritage. Mm -hmm. Uh, ancient Arabia, he speaks of, speaking the, the, the uh, pro uh, pro propagating uh, classic Arabic and, and culture. These are the kind of things they were doing. And lastly, is that why I mentioned protecting this legacy because it's so important, the bits and pieces that we have, there's a lot more story to this. But, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, is the fact that <clears throat> there are other people who want to be relevant that uh, probably uses this to, to, to add to their celebrity and they have to realize that people have given their lives. They have, they have, they have interrupted their lives. They have, they have given up their careers. They have drugged their families through all kinds of atrocities and hardship 
trying to establish communities of Islam. And if you read the clippings in the newspaper, you'll find that they were constantly buying property, constantly opening up. Uh, uh, they were, matter of fact, uh, uh, one of the places that they did have was for the masjid, but they were building a masjid and a school at the same time. And this was different parts of the country, Philadelphia, that's PA, New Jersey. There was a uh, 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 New York, uh, New York and also Detroit. Yeah, these are so many things. So what I'm saying is basically that uh, none of these people spill a drop of blood. Yeah. All right, they should they should stay in their lane, and there are people still alive and that they, they they haven't consulted with. Yeah. Should stay in their lane and let someone tell the story who was who was actually in the house yeah. and around about those who was in the house and those who was in the house. Thank you. Absolutely, sure. absolutely. And you know, we're going to get to to the the, the units that he actually established. Um, here on uh, the East Coast and also in, in some parts of the, the Midwest, um, inshallah ta'ala. And definitely, you know, we have two of uh, uh, the, uh, the offspring, you know, uh, from this particular organization. Uh, we have Sheikh Mohammed and we have uh, Sheikh uh, Ali. Jabba, Jabba, who, you know, training, training basically stems from the uh, Dean of Law University of Arabic Association, um, uh, Professor Mohammed um, as a dean, uh, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. But, but again, again, what is what this, is this legacy, legacy that we're trying to uh, uphold, right? right? Because we know that he was um, not too successful um, in migrating to, to Turkey, right? And you see the newspaper clipping, this is, you know, 1930s, right? So he then look toward Egypt, right? So um, Sheikh Mohammed, can you talk about, you know, what did he actually uh, accomplish while he was in Egypt? Yes, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier that uh, Sheikh Mohammed Azadeen, uh, after being, you know, in Turkey for a short period of time, he did not see the amenities uh, that he had expected. So uh, he, he returned to Egypt. Uh, in fact, he returned to, he went to Egypt uh, continuing his hijrah, not, not with the uh, idea, idea of returning to America. And when he went there, he actually uh, went to Jamil al-Sar. You see, Jamil al-Sar is actually the, the masjid, the masjid uh, of al-Asar, wherein they actually had uh, uh, small madrasas that taught each Islamic science there. And actually, he was actually a student there. And he was accommodated by the general center world, young Muslim men, uh, association. Uh, he was uh, accommodated there along with other Muslims that travel uh, from from various places in, 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 on the on the planet, in various Muslim countries. And he went there to uh, to uh, actually start his Islamic education. And he actually stayed there for approximately five years. Okay, five years intensively uh, acquire, acquiring the proper understanding of Islam, and 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 actually. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we know that uh, there was actually a, a revolution. There was a protest, a student protest within Egypt around 1935. It started. It created an unsettled environment, being that he was actually a non-Egyptian. Uh, he was American. He could not actually uh, 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 find any real security. So uh, we, we, we think that upon that type of commotion that he returned to America. By, by default, not by intention, because his first uh, intention was to make a, a permanent uh, migration from America. No, sure. And uh, before we move on to our next question, uh, please just want to remind everyone to um, place them, place themselves on mute, um, because any it picks up all sound and then it, uh, get a lot of feedback. So please just put yourself on mute, and uh, brother Amir, if you can kind of just uh, help with managing that. Um, those that unmute themselves, just make sure that they actually, uh, that they're, they're actually muted. Inshallah, jazakumullah khair. So let's go to um, question, question number um, three, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Ali. Ali. Um, and I know we kind of like touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, we really want to focus on which brand of Islam did um, Professor um, Azadeen bring back, you know, to to America because. Um, if we look at the, the climate at that particular time, there were a lot of, uh, you know, different types of organizations that were um, attaching themselves to the Islamic identity or the Muslim identity. Um, however, um, there was no real sign connection to the Quran and the verses of the Quran. 
there was no true connection to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, you know, you know what made Professor Azadeen unique um, in his studies and, and bringing it back to to America. Well, Bismillah, salatu salamu rasulillah wa alaihi wasallam wa Well, basically, when you're looking at the person himself, um, he stole for an identity. He did not look at Islam as something random or another religion, or he found himself reconnecting through bloodline. And, and he understood that Islam was a divine heritage for him, which motivated him to move further, further in terms of his Islamic education. Now, what's obvious about him and what's unique about him is that he immediately began to establish houses of wisdom. He immediately began to propagate education and promote education. And uh, Len Hope uh, Hajja uh, Abdul Rashid is, uh, is one of his uh, students. And, and I guess you'll talk about that as we go along. But one of the, one of the motivating things is that he found that this was his, uh, Islam was his birthright. And understanding that, and, and those, those who were around him, understanding, understanding that, motivated him to do unprecedented things. And I think uh, uh, we were being, you know, we're going to need the whole program to, yeah. to discuss that. <laughs> but he did some really unprecedented things. And that's one of the reasons why that you should look at the person, the AAUAA and, and, and Professor Ezzuddin was the same. You can't separate the two. You know, it's like right, right hand, left hand. And those people who were diligent. And I think some of the guests will come on today. today that's uh, that's uh, that uh, sons and uh, of, of many of the people that were around him, uh, or, or especially uh, Wahab Abu Bakr. We actually like Wahab Abu Bakr, his son, I think, uh, Malik Abu Bakr will be on. They, they'll give you some real intimate insights on the professor. But right now, as a person, as a leader, as a, as a, as a Muslim, he immediately began to teach Islam in its purest form. And if you read the handbook that they were distributed to all of the uh, members, that, that, that is one of the emphasis there you know, in that book, and we'll talk about that later, inshallah. No, subhanallah. And, um, you know, Sheikh Mohammed, if you can kind of like elaborate too on like some specific uh, tenets of Islam that he actually kind of like focused on. And if you see my screen, if the audience see my screen, here are some actual uh, newspaper clippings of the coverage. You know, subhanallah, you know, the coverage that Professor Azadine was actually getting in the 30s. Uh, and he, and, and, and the newspaper, the media, they were actually publishing, you know, his, his, his teachings, you know, his preaching and so, and so forth and so on, right? So can you kind of elaborate on some of the specific maybe, maybe uh, situations, situations that, that um, kind of uh, highlights that, that, that he was teaching the Sunnah, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah? Yes, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, before, I, before we go, to the, into that area, I like to just backtrack a little bit okay. and just kind of, you know, make us understand that when Professor uh, Muhammad Azadine uh, left uh, from America going to Turkey, he went as a Muslim. Uh, and I also mentioned that uh, there's a, a possibility that he and uh, uh, Seti Majid uh, had an encounter. And Seti Majid himself was a, a, was a Islamic missionary a worker in America from Sudan who himself encountered the, the, the Moorish Science Temple. Uh, it had to be around 1927 because that's when the El Quran was written uh, by uh, Durali or actually the plagiarized version of, uh, of the Aquarian Gospel by Levi Downing. It was written around 1927 and, and, and actually presented uh, into, inside of the Moorish Science Temple. And there was a fatwa uh, that was uh, uh, given to Al Asar by Seti Majid and they ruled that that particular organization was definitely un-Islamic. And I'm saying that to say that uh, Professor Ezra Muhammad was clear that uh, the Moorish Science Temple was not actually uh, the correct form of Islam. So he changed his name from Lomax Bay to uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, and then he went to Egypt and he studied there five years and he came back as Ustaz or Professor Muhammad Azadine. So, and when he came back, it, uh, they, as uh, Ustaz Yusuf mentioned, that the papers captured uh, actually the Eid. And we, we, we have to conclude that probably the first indigenous Eid performed uh, uh, in America, you know, and, uh, 
And uh, he actually went through all the other kinds or all the pillars of Islam. He explained basically as what we have in the traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a letter for letter. Also the, the flag in which uh, Professor Ezzedine Muhammad adopted for the Adinu Allahi Universal Arabic Association was the flag of La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, which made it clear. And he said that we acknowledge the sovereignty of Arabia, which is the birthplace of Islam. And uh, that is something very unique uh, about uh, uh, the Adinu Allahi Universal Arabic Association, that they was actually propagating the Sunnah from the very uh, uh, onset. And, and, and that's a lot of the uh, information is, is captured uh, in the media or in the press that relates to his Islam. And they identify them as, as Muslim Arabs, meaning that he not only did he come back with, 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 with Islam, but he also came back with an identity with a heritage. And we're going to talk about that later on as we no. uh, advance in the no. program, inshallah. Well, alhamdulillah, I mean, if you look at uh, some of these um, articles, I mean, one thing, again, was the identity. Um, he reconnected uh, the Muslims back to uh, Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Um, and through the lineage of Ismail, alayhi salam, back to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam. Right, so this was extremely important uh, for the displaced uh, uh, indi uh, indigenous uh, uh, Muslims that, that, that we would reconnect, not just with the tenets of faith, but also with, with identity. Um, and subhanAllah, when you look at even the, the article in the, in the middle, um, and I, I know that you can't re really read it, but hopefully, inshallah, these things can be shared with Brother Amir and, and the museum, you know, as, as display. But, you know, hearing someone in the 1937-1938 talking about uh, Ida Adha, mm -hmm. talking about, you know, in this article, you know, Muharram, you know, the, the Hijra new, new Year calendar, He's also quoting, for example, um, uh, the Islamic New Year. He's using the Islamic New Year uh, and the Islamic calendar, Dhul Hijjah. So he's using these terminologies in this article. Uh, he's talking about the Muslims praying five times a day. Um, he's talking about the mandatory Friday prayer. Uh, and he's also even, he mentioned, you know, and, and this is something uh, of the Hanafi faith where, uh, and other, you know, difference of opinion about should the khutbah be and, and and only Arabic. Mm -hmm. And subhanAllah, when you read this, this article, uh, Professor uh, Azadeen was uh, under the opinion that the khutbah should be done in, 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 in the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. um, and if you see the article on my right, it says the Quran replaces Bible and court for action for Muslims. So there was a, this, a dispute that uh, they had to actually go to court. And instead, you know, when you go to court, you have to, you know, swear, you know, especially by then on the, on the Bible but they did not compromise. They did not compromise their faith. And instead of swearing on this, they replaced it with the Quran, SubhanAllah. You know, and this is documented history. Yeah, um, but there's an interesting point. I want to no. go back to uh, Sir Yusuf. It was a general ruling in the Muslim world that a khutbah should only be done yeah. in Arabic. It wasn't, it wasn't just <laughs> no, him. No, I mean, he was no. in, in accord with the, a general ruling at that time. Absolutely. That absolutely. You know, the khutbah only should be done in Arabic. Yeah. No, alhamdulillah. And two, I mean, you mentioned the, the, the House of Wisdom or the School of Wisdom mm -hmm. of AAUAA. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was, you know, I guess the curriculum, you know, what was being taught um, in this particular uh, institution uh, of, of knowledge? Mm -hmm. Uh, the basic archons of Islam, no. um, uh, uh, the, the, the staple of that, those schools was Hadith Jibreel, uh, when, uh, the, when uh, Jibreel uh, approached the Prophet وسلم, and asked him about Islam, asked him about you know, uh, Iman, and asked him about uh, uh, Ihsan. And, 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 and if you know of these, this particular Hadith, which is a very famous Hadith, this is the basis of where what this, this is the, the that formed their 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 institution, their curriculum, their syllabus. All the children know it. And then I remember in classes that were held uh, in Ezzedine Ezzedine Village, Ezzedine, Ezzedine which Village. is a very interesting thing to mention that they had a township, you know, and there was chartered and incorporated, uh, and people were living on the village. So they taught, uh, as you'll see in some of the 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 the, the um, the uh, newspaper articles with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, 
the hope, you'll find that Arabic, they will begin to advance in the Arabic language. So the courses were not only taught, I mean, the basic Islamic uh, tenets and practices and belief was not just taught with, uh, uh, in English, they were taught in Arabic. And that was very, very interesting at the time. And, and, and if, based on the time we were, if they had the means, within one generation, you would have had an Arabic speaking generation. And many of them did become proficient in Arabic and went abroad. And many of them uh, uh, taught Arabic for many years to come. And, and so Arabic has been taught for at least now over uh, nearly a hundred years no, no, so in, uh, in America. I'm, and and subhanAllah, <laughs> I mean, uh, I was reading something last year, um, uh, you know, a Muslim um, scholar, he posted that Lynn Hope, you know, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rashid, Abdul Rashid. Um, Abdul that he was the first, he was considered the first American to actually travel abroad and study Islam formally. Right. And this was in 19, uh, I think 52, yeah, 1952. Uh, 1952. Yes. Um, however, this person was unaware of the travels of Professor um, as a dean in 19 in the, uh, 1930 um, and returning in 1936. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, Lynn Hope, he was a, a progeny, <laughs> you know, of the AAUAA. Um, so we we'll just want to talk a little bit about this personality um, and why was he such uh, a fr famous personality until he was actually, he got a lot of coverage himself mm -hmm. Uh, I think Ebony Ebony Magazine yes. uh, covered his story. Yeah. So let's talk about um, this personality, um, uh, Lynn Hope or uh, our brother, uh, Abdul Rashid. Alhamdulillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim One thing that is unique about uh, Lynn Hope, again, is that he made a hijra. You know, he went to uh, Lebanon. And, and also he actually performed the pilgrimage in 1952. And his, in prior, his prior profession was he was a jazz, uh, actually a real published uh, jazz uh, artist. He was very famous. Even in his travels abroad, he was known and he would actually uh, perform in some of the actual places there. But uh, he had a formal Islamic education. Uh, the record states that he was uh, practically fluent in the Arabic language. As you can see, he was the uh, Imam of Dar al Hikmah in Philadelphia. Um, you know, his family was very uh, proficient and he himself, uh, as uh, Ustad used to mention, was a progeny of uh, Professor Ezzedine Muhammad, and he also uh, uh, claimed an, an out of heritage and out of identity. Uh, he shunned the cloak of Negro, uh, the colonial titles of a subjugated people, so forth and so on. And he defended that, you know, on the frontiers and so forth and so on. But definitely, uh, he uh, changed from the jazz musician to an actually imam, and he began to, uh, you know, teach and give dawa. And uh, he was a very, very profound person. And this was in uh, 1950s. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and his family. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And I see that we have, um, or before we bring in some of our guests, uh, we have um, Sheikh Omar and also um, uh, Hajj uh, Dawood Adiola um, on the line with us. Um, but I, we're gonna bring in them after we kind of tackle this question, uh, because we did kind of talk about the identity component um, that he uh, affiliated himself with and also the organization um, AAUAA. So why did he claim the, the Hermetic um, Arab identity? Um, Bismillah. One thing that is unique about uh, Professor Muhammad Azadine is that before uh, he traveled, he had identified himself as a Moor. And we know that in the uh, Negro laws or the slave codes in the South, Negro was synonymous to slave. Uh, a person with dark complexion, possibly from, uh, from uh, Africa, the African uh, continent, so forth and so on. However, there was an exemption uh, in the slave codes that exempted Moors, uh, Egyptians, and Lascar Indians, meaning people that had the same uh, phenotype as the so-called Negro who had the same complexion and shared the same lands. However, it was the status of a Moor being a, a citizen or subject of a, of a sovereign Islamic state that gave them the exemption. Uh, you know, we, we know the history of Abraham Lincoln representing a Moor as well in a court case uh, before he became the president, mentioning that his, uh, 
his uh, client had black skin, but yet he was not a Negro. So Professor uh, Ezzedine Muhammad was aware uh, prior to traveling that the, the Moors was the last sovereign stance that people of color had in this, this society. So, so when he went into Egypt, uh, he not only did he study no Islam, what do I do? Come out? he also studied the history of our people. And in our mission statement is not only to teach Eastern culture, but also to build and maintain a national institution to educate and rescue the Hamitic people and bring them back into the high civilization that they once enjoyed. So he actually uh, was educated in the history of our people. And if you look at some of the classical maps, like for, for example, the map of uh, Herodotus, who was a, a Greek historian who lived in the fifth century uh, BC, uh, when he divided in his uh, analogy of, of the world, he divided it into three continents, you know, Europe, Africa, and Asia. However, Professor Ezzedin understood that Ham, uh, the son of Noah, peace be upon him, had four sons, Put, Cush, Mishran, and Canaan. And Put was the one who was in Libya. And I remind you, Libya was the land no, uh, north, uh, uh, west of the Nile. You know, not the Libya that we have today in Tripoli, et cetera, but from the northwest of the Nile. And that is where the, the descendants of Push, Put lived. Also, Misraim was the people of the Nile on the east side of the Nile, not the, the Egypt that we know today, but from Alexandria all the way into the Sudan with the parting of the Niles. And the Kushites themselves live from the Nile River all the way into the Tigris Euphrates. And the Canaanites live in the Levant, which is Palestine and, and, and uh, uh, what we call um, uh, Jordan today. So he understood that these lands were actually the lands of the Hamitic uh, uh, nations. And the Semites or the Semitic nation were absorbed as they lived in there. So he understood the, the, the history of Hagar, which was an Egyptian. He understood the Southern Arabians who were the ancient Kushites, whom Ismail married into that tribe and so forth. And he understood that when Islam spread beyond the borders of Arabia, there was something called uh, Istariba or the Arabization of the African continent. So he did not invent uh, the, the identity. He actually discovered who these people were. And again, he, he removed the, the, the cloak of the, of the colonial term or the Jim Crow term Negro, which was synonymous with slave. And this is something very important that's related to our legacy is our identity, the national institution that we built. And I think it's, it's only fair that, that scholars and historians, when they actually uh, uh, revisit, you know, the the, the history of the Adino Alahi University of Arabic Association, they have to acknowledge and give credit to Professor Muhammad Azadeen for this identity. We cannot uh, allow him to allow this organization or Professor Azadeen uh, individually to be reclassified, you know, with the same colonial terms that he actually tried to actually uh, uh, avoid. So for example, we know that uh, once upon a time, you know, the classification or the reassignment of those people who came by way of the African diaspora was Negro. And then we know it evolved to color as they had an admixture of the Europeans and the natives and those people who had a lighter hue, they no longer wanted to be called blacks. And then we had the black power movement, which became the, the Afro-American people trying to reconnect to the African continent with some sense of identity and heritage and so forth. And now we have a term that came about in 1988 uh, by uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who actually, uh, uh, who actually made an effort to assign all of those people put everybody into one social group and call them African American. And that's not fair to our legacy, our history, and the ev evidence and information that we have that is very accurate. So we would encourage the scholars and historians when they cite uh, 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 any of the functions of the Adino Lash University Arabic Association, please reassign them to the identity in which uh, we actually started with. Plus, as we said, uh, Yusuf mentioned earlier, that identity was attached to it. And when you saw the Quran replaces the Bible in, in, in the courts, that's because our charter was chartered as a hermetic out of organization, not mm -hmm. as any other organization. So they had to acknowledge our identity, even in the courts and no, so forth and no. so on. So that's something that we, we actually uh, hold dear to our, ourselves as, as being unique with mm -hmm. an identity that connects us back, as Professor Ezra Muhammad said, anyone who is a descendant no. of Ismail through his father Ibrahim or the mother Hagar or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are of the Arab descent, no. the, the, regardless of color, complexion, place, and, and no. time. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Before you close, I just yeah. want to add one little small point. Yes. Is that 
Professor Azadine, he, his attire, his language, yes. his social norms and everything reflected, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a Muslims in hiding. Yes. They, were, they were visible and they wore their attire, not only to the conventions, but also every day. And this was very, very important in the early turn of the no. century. So those are one of the things that we we'll, we'll just to attach to what you're saying. We saw that. It wasn't no. something that was hidden. And subhanAllah, too, when you think of also um, another progeny of Professor Azadine, uh, Sheikh Dawood Faisal. Yep. Um, and actually, mm -hmm. it's documented that Sheikh Dawood Faisal was a mentee of Professor Azadine. Mm -hmm. And subhanAllah, even today, our brothers and sisters, they don't realize that Sheikh Dawood Faisal was American born. Uh, and most people are under the impression that he was Moroccan or I even, someone even posted uh, last week, Caribbean. you know, that he was a Nigerian, so, <laughs> and lot, yeah. you know. So even Sheikh Dawood Faisal um, out of um, New York, Brooklyn, New York, Rahimullah, he also had this identity to the point where anyone that he interacted with they understood, you know, his identity. Um, and uh, we have some guests and I, I wanna bring in our guests and I know we have some, some questions coming in. Uh, so brother Emil, we will address the questions. So we wanna hear from our, our guests and these uh, honorable guests, uh, SubhanAllah, brother Omar Mubarak and also uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Dawood Adiola, you know, they was also part of Adina Law University Arabic Association, you know, they had significant roles, right, in keeping the legacy uh, alive of Professor Azadine and, and of this particular organization. So I want to first bring in Sheikh Dawood uh, Adiola. Um, I see that he's here. Just talk to us a, a little bit about your experience with um, Adina Law. I mean, how did you come in contact with this particular organization and I mean, what was your, your role uh, with the Adina Law? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Musaat Wasalam, Al Rasul Hilkarim, Wala Ali, Musaat Wasalam, Tislima, Shirwa, La ilaha illallah, wa Shirwa, and Muhammad Abduhu, or Rasul, wa Badu. Salam alaikum, Rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, just making sure that I'm, that I'm heard. So, first of all, uh, I uh, want to say Jazakum Allah Khair for the organizers, you know, uh, especially the Jabba family and your constituents are uh, a very important subject, <clears throat> an overlooked subject in, in the study of uh, Al-Islam in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, briefly, I know we have other people, so I'll be very brief, inshallah. Uh, I was, uh, I took Shahada actually with Imam Mubarak Hassan, Rahimahullah, who was the... Uh, um, one of the early uh, students of Muhammad uh, Izzuddin, Elder Staz Izzuddin, Rahimahullah. In fact, you'll even see, you'll see uh, uh, Mubarak Hassan uh, in some of the pictures, you know, from the, uh, especially the one from the United Islamic Society. Uh, he came in, he came under the teachings of the professor when he was about 16. And uh, then he was drafted into World War II and he maintained his Islam during his military service and suffered greatly. But uh, that, that, was, that was my first imam. And he performed my nikah in 1969. And uh, I took shahada with him. I studied in the school where they had the madrasa in Buffalo, New York. Um, had several locations, but uh, that's... Uh, Actually, even before that, I had uh, grown up in a neighborhood where there was some. Oh, there was an older Muslim family around the corner, and it was uh, there was a brother. His name was Dawood, actually Dawood Ramadan, whose whose nephew was in the neighborhood, and he's the first. He's the first. He's the first one told me my name was was Dawood. You know, my my birth name. You know, by, for my parents was David, and so that came from. That's why the spelling. You notice if you see Dawood spelled in this particular way, way D A W O U D. It, uh, it strongly suggests that there's there's a connection with the with the AAUAA. Uh, so uh, moving up, uh, I uh, was with the school, and then I became involved with Jabal Arabia, 
through that connection, uh, we were going there, taking our kids there, and uh, which of course, like is being village was a land-based community, which still exists, and we are we are still working to maintain and and, and revitalize Jabal Arabia community. And we have never left. We have never given up our uh, hermetic identity or the uh, AAUIA organizational title is still active in New York State. Uh, in 1991, uh, 1990, uh, I became Imam of Jabal Arabia after the Imam there, you know, uh, passed away and I buried him. I performed Janazah and buried him and I was asked to be the Imam of Jabal Arabia. And uh, we had, uh, during my tenure there, we had uh, the 50th anniversary of the Adina Light Universal Arab Association, Association uh, in 1992, November 17th, 1992. I was fortunate to uh, be on the land with some of the elders, some of the pioneers were still alive. Uh, people like Sheikh Dawood Ghani, uh, Farida Sadiq, uh, Nafisa Habib, Rahimahullah, who all have passed on. I, I buried most of them uh, with my own hand and uh, the Janaza. And so um, that's pretty much my connection uh, with the Adeno. Right now, we still have the Buffalo, the headquarters of New York State located in Buffalo, which was established by the professor. Uh, we have the, you know, incorporated in 1938. And so um, in a nutshell, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's my connection with the organization. I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop now. I got tons of paper. You know, uh, I invited one brother. His, his name is uh, uh, Hajrafa Habib, who was about 83 years old. And his father was one of the early presidents of the uh, AUAA, uh, Jabal Arabia. He was a president in Buffalo. And then when they moved out on the land, he was president there, too. And uh, so we, we he, definitely want to hear, the, you know, about the land, uh, the land grant, um, Jabal Arabi. So now, um, either you or the, the brother can kind of just talk a little bit about that, because this is very significant to the history of AAUAA, because we know that when he chartered in 1938, he was trying to make a national organ not national charter. However, mm -hmm. New Jersey wouldn't allow him to do the national charter. So that's where he went to uh, New York to establish the Jebel Arabi. So that now. was like really the first colony of mm -hmm. AUAA, and then later on, he came back to New Jersey to establish the Azuddin village. So can you just talk about that first colony and what was, I guess, the functions of, of the colony or even uh, the brother um, that you invited, maybe he can talk about that, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. I don't know if Haj Rifai, if he made it or not, but uh, uh, what uh, we, we did, uh, extensive interviews when we did the, uh, the 50th anniversary in the early 90s we 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 uh, we hunted down as many of the elders as we could and we we interviewed them and uh, to find out exactly that you know what what was the motivation uh, what was their connection with the professor what did what did he teach how did he teach and uh, what they brought forward you know from the teachings and uh, I got a lot uh, I think I got more than anything from anybody else I got from Imam uh, Hassan Mubarak, you know, because like I said, he was, he was a lieutenant, uh, very close to a professor up here. And, uh, and he was young too. So he was, uh, uh, you know, he came in when he was 16. He, he, uh, we buried him about uh, eight years ago. He lived to be uh, 90. And so he had dementia toward the end, but he, he relayed uh, quite a bit of information uh, about it, even though he was he was located in Buffalo. So uh, Sheikh Dawood Ghani is the one that we got most of the uh, information about the land. And uh, basically uh, what he said was that professor told them that if you want to have a real Islamic community, you have to get land, you must have land. And when you get the land, then you, you, you build your house, you build your home, then you, know, you build your school, you establish your stores and your means of production. And, uh, you, you know, in other words, you'd you be as self-sufficient as, 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 as possible. And, uh, um, and you build, they say you build your school first and, and because the most important thing is to establish Islamic education. And then you can pray in the school until you establish the masjid, until you build the masjid. 
And that's exactly what they did. The, the first masjid was built out there. I think it's the oldest masjid in the history of uh, Western New York that was built to be a masjid. And it goes back to uh, 1970 or 71. And we call it Masjid Izzeldeen. And uh, it's still standing, but it's, in, it's badly in need of, 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 of repair. Uh, but the uh, structure is, is still there. Uh, the one brother that gave a lot of information, Sheikh Dawood Ghani, uh, when the professor told, when they got the act, they actually, the story of how they got the land is that they went out and they found some land. I think at first it was five acres. They came back and reported to the professor that they, they had found five or 10 acres. He told them that's not enough, keep looking. And so they went out and they found uh, another plot, which is more like about 40 or 50. He said, keep looking, we need more land. And finally, uh, they met a lady named Sarah Bigelow, who, who had a farm uh, out there in, in uh, what they call Cataraugus County. And uh, uh, it had a, had a mountain on it called Breadloaf Mountain. And Breadloaf Mountain is the highest point of elevation in Western New York, about 1,700 feet above sea level. And it was 300 acres. And they came back and reported to the professor that they found 300 acres. He said, get that one, buy that one. And so that's what they did. And later on, they added 25 acres. So now it's 325 acres still standing. And so they began to move. Uh, some people build homes, some people pull trailers out. This one brother, uh, Brother Ghani, he actually told the professor, in his own words, he said, he told the professor, well, I kind of I like the house I have now. Uh, you know, suppose I can I move it out there? And the Professor told him, "Yeah, if you can move it, move it." Yeah. So Check that out. Then um, we, you know, we want to save some for part two, inshallah, Tyler. So oh, okay. right now All we're right. just uh, uh, scratching the surface, um, yeah. getting you know the, uh, our audience uh, their mouths mo mo uh, moist for more, inshallah, Tyler. Now, okay, definitely, inshallah, yeah. we have to pay another visit. You know, because we want to definitely kind of start really documenting uh, this, this this history, inshallah, Tyler, and really, you know, putting out you know to the public because I think everyone, you know, is thirsty for for for, for this history, inshallah, Tyler. So that. we want to bring in um, Sheikh Omar Mubarak, um, and he was significant to um, the other colony um, in New Jersey. You know, which is known as um, as a daily image. Um, so, Sheikh Omar, can you just talk, tell us a little bit of how you encountered um, Adina Law Universal Arabic Association, and you know, what was, I guess, your role or function within within the organization, Inshallah Taala? No, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa All right, uh, I'm here and. I'll say to you, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The brother just spoke before me, Aki. I don't know who you and I have ever met before, but I tell you, it's my pleasure to meet with you, Aki, and one day perhaps we will meet and talk and break, and break bread together. I would love to do that. But I'm not going to break bread with you with, it, with this virus going on. We have to do that over the phone, I guess. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Haji, Haji, assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Uh, I'd like to bring you, bring my brothers and sisters <clears throat> uh, up to date when I came into Dean Laha Universal Arabic Association. I lived in New York. All, I lived in all of New York City all of my life, <clears throat> except for right now. I'm living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oops. And, after I retired in electronics, I moved down here to Charlotte with me and my wife and my son uh, because I'm a veteran and I had never used my, uh, what do you call it? Yeah. My VA benefits. And I lived in a, an apartment all my life. So this is my first house. So now I'm here for 30 years. So me and my wife, we're sitting here on the on the couch, and the 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 thoughts are coming back and flooding back right now. But uh, now that your brother's sitting here, and I'm I'm pushing ninety now. Not so sure. just be just be a little little patient with me. 
in approximately 1961, I left the Air Force and took my, I was working in electronics all my life. <clears throat> and I'm gonna make this short, I'm not gonna make it long because what happened was at that particular time, those of you who lived around that time knew that the, the air was full of electricity like it is now. With uh, Malik Mal 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 Shabazz and uh, all, the, all of the uh, uh, things that were going on uh, socially, socially. Thank you, babe. So I used to leave my job. I worked in downtown Manhattan and I was an elect electronic, uh, a test engineer or engineering associate. And I used to come on the subway, get off at 125th street. And for some reason I would, now I lived in the Bronx, but I would walk 125th street to get to the street speakers. The street speakers was on 125th street and 7th Avenue. And they were saying things that I'd never heard before. They were all uh, so uh, so called nationalists, but I, I consider that particular time uh, an awakening for me. And uh, we used to sit down on the corner, 125th Street and Seventh Avenue, and listen to the street speakers. And after the street speaker spoke, he would break up. We would break up into little groups, and that's when I met. My first, I call my first uh, true uh, teacher, and that was Hamza Saeed. Now Hamza Saeed uh, was, was an older man, and I was only still in my early, my late 20s, early 30s. And as we broke into these groups, I had never met anybody who had spoken and given such, with such eloquent, eloquence about his own self, own self, who he was. So he said, well, he's going to start some classes up in the Bronx. He said, uh, what's your name? Write it down and I'll call you and you come to my house on Kelly Street, which I did. And that I called my awakening. Now, I'm not going to go into everything because this, this could take a little bit of time. I'm not going to do that to you. But I would say approximately three or four months after that, it was Hamza Saeed who gave me Shahada. Now, and I, I took it after the, the second day, but I want you to know that prior to that, I did go to listen to um, who's a, who's Malcolm X and who was the other one? The, the, his leader, Malik uh, Elijah Muhammad. And after listening to him and listening, I listening, I said no. I said this is not it, and that's when I met Hamza. Well, to make a long story short, I took Shahada with Hamza Saeed, and he introduced me to this organization called Adina Lahir Universal Arabic Association, stationed in New Jersey. But they had what we called units all over the country, one, and one was in New York. And that's, we used to go down to, 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 to what, we, what we used to call at that time, we called Cedar Avenue. So we would go down and spend the 4th of July weekend down there from all over uh, various parts of the country. And that's when I learned, when I, I was first in, introduced to Sunni Islam. And I said, I said to myself, I knew that there was something out there like that. I knew, I didn't know where it was and I knew it. Well, anyway, I'm gonna just make this long story short. I met uh, Haji Sham Jabber, and uh, I call him one of the lights of my life, but indeed, Hisham Jabber knew what I wanted to know, and so many of the, uh, of the other brothers. And th they had such dignity, and then, the nationalism plus the Islam looked like they, I know it was impossible, but it looked, seems to me that they, they knew it all. I said, well, I wanna be with these people. So it was, uh, I would say about 1961, 
Hamza Saeed said, time for you to be a Muslim. I said, well, yes, I'm ready. And I took Shahada right there in his little, his little uh, living room. And Alhamdulillah, and at that time, those of us who were taking Shahada, we were all changing our names uh, to more identify with who we knew of ourselves to be. And that was in 1961. And I marked that time because that is about the time that uh, the first American uh, uh, traveled uh, uh, and uh, what was the name? What's the first American that went, went up into space? Well, him. <laughs> that's when I took, that's when I took Shahada. So that's the only way I can mark it. I can't mark it with the time because when things happen, you don't just say, it's the, and now it's June 4th or whatever it is. That's how I marked that particular time. And I learned so much from Brother Wahab, Wahab Abu Bakr and uh, Brother Haji Sham Jabber and the other brothers. There is so much that, yeah. that you have to know. And if we can spend a little bit more time, another time we can do, do one more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can really spend more time. And we're definitely going to have a part two, um, Sheikh Omar, but please, you know, before before you leave, talk about your role in Azadin Village. Yes. Yes. I was uh, commissioned by uh, Wahab Abu Bakr to change. We had a street that went right down, Esseldin, right down the middle of Esseldin Village, but it wasn't called Esseldin Village. When we went to New Jersey, we would say we're going to Cedar Avenue. So Abu Bakr commissioned me to go down or to, to contact the, uh, the authorities in, Essel, in, uh, in Hamilton, New Jersey, to change the name that went straight through, to change that name to Essel Dean's Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so when I called, they, they just happened to be in session at the time. And they told me based on that, based on, on that, they couldn't do it. They couldn't name the, the, the street Esseldine Village, as I had requested, because I am on to report back to, to uh, um, Abu Wahab Abu Bakr now. But they said they got their little confidence. They came back on the phone and told me that they could name the whole village Esseldine Village. They said, would you accept that? Well, well I said, yes, right away. Now, I, did, I, I, didn't, I didn't call uh, Wahab, Abu Bakr, Wahab Abu Bakr and ask him. I just jumped at it. But anyway, it just so happens that Wahab Abu Bakr was very pleased with that. And from that time on, we the whole area is known as Esseldine Village. Kalafik brother Omar, inshallah, and definitely uh better Kalafik brother Omar. And definitely we're gonna invite you back for part two, inshallah, Tyler, to to uh to enlighten us with some of the other details of your experience with you know AA UAA. And you, and, you and mentioned I a, a very ahead. important point that, you know, I mean, when you were introduced with uh, another, you know, kind of Islam, you knew that wasn't it. But when you yes. used to Sunni Islam, you said, you know, this this has to be it. And yeah. I think this is a misconception that when they see uh, indigenous Muslims, people automatically assume that they had to go through uh, more science temple or the nation of Islam or any mm -hmm. other you know, uh, uh, facet of Islam before they actually got to the Sunnah. And mm -hmm. this is not the case for many of the uh, the members of AA, UAA. You know, they were, uh, they took their Shahada from day one upon, you know, the Quran and, 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 and the Sunnah. And subhanAllah, I know you have the outer blood in you because <laughs> you mark your Shahada according to a major event. And we know <laughs> that this was, you know, the, the custom of the Arab, you know, like <laughs> Feel, you know, yeah. the, the, the event of the, the elephant when the Prophet mm -hmm. he was actually born mm -hmm. in, in this particular year, inshallah. So we're moving, we're concluding our program. We have one more question to address and then we will um, go right into some, um, inshallah, take a few questions if Brother Amir would allow us to address a few questions. Uh, but our last question for tonight, and, you know, we know that we need probably two or three more parts, you know, to kind of dig deep into, you know, this rich history 
of Islam and the pioneers of Sunni Islam in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So the last part, inshallah ta'ala, was uh, the conference, Uniting Muslim Society Conference of 1943. Um, so Sheikh Mohammed, um, can you kind of address the significance of this particular conference? Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. Yes, um, as we mentioned earlier that the Adin Lahi Universal Arabic Association was uh, chartered as a Hamitic uh, Islamic uh, Arab organization in 1936, 38, uh, excuse me. And, uh, and, and, and like uh, Sheikh uh, Imam Daoud uh, mentioned that they were actually uh, a farm and land. It was an agrarian community. They are building their own homes uh, and, and building schools and learning. And, uh, and so there was actually a lot of uh, activity going on as a result of, of the efforts of uh, Professor Ezzedine to spread the dawah uh, uh, of the Quran and the Sunnah. <clears throat> However, one thing that is unique about uh, Professor Azim Muhammad Rahimullah is that he was a he was a team player. You know, he was he he believed in inclusion, and uh, and there were many many different types of uh, pseudo Islamic groups at that particular time. So six years later, you know, uh, he made a concerted effort, you know, uh, with along with other organizations to bring them together to a, a what we call a national conference, you know, and uh, actually the heads of these different communities and their constituents to try to find uh, a balance where they can all work together on a, a, on a comprehensive and collective agenda. Um, and he uh, organized the, uh, uh, the conference and we have some very distinguished personalities there such as uh, Imam uh, uh, Wali Akram, he was there, uh, Sheikh uh, Dawu Faisal was there uh, along with that and some other distinguished uh, uh, personalities. And what is unique about this conference is that uh, uh, the first mosque of, of Cleveland that was founded by uh, Imam uh, Wali Akram in the very beginning was actually under the persuasion of the Ahmadiyya movement. And it was after his encounter with uh, Sheikh uh, Professor Muhammad Azadeen that he actually denounced the, uh, the Ahmadiyya uh, uh, doctrine and he embraced the Sunnah and separated himself and established you know, a masjid in Cleveland on the Sunnah. And he was at that conference with the 10 year plan. Uh, Sheikh uh, Dawood uh, Faisal prior was actually a muqaddim or an, a, a representative for a uh, Tanzania uh, 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 Wali uh, Sufi Sheikh. Uh, uh, when he encountered um, Professor Ezzedine Muhammad, he himself actually uh, abandoned those uh, principles and he came into Brooklyn and established the uh, American Muslim mission there on State Street. It's still there today, alhamdulillah. So these are some of the uh, personalities and pioneers was at that meeting. And also there was the Ahmadiyya uh, uh, contingency there as well. What Professor Azim Muhammad was attempting to do was actually bring all the Muslims together, you know, under one banner, one under one umbrella and actually reconnect them to Mecca, you know, a, a, as their, their divine heritage. And this is where he mentioned the flag itself. They should adopt the, the Kalima Shahada flag uh, with the two swords underneath as a symbol of to defend, defend themselves and to defend Islam. And the meeting was actually conducted in a very professional manner. They sought to get results, so forth and so on. And this says a lot about uh, our, our, our Sheikh Muhammad Azadeen, that he was actually uh, uh, sincere, he was inclusive. He wanted to uh, spread the dawah, the correct understanding of Islam. Uh, to all the Muslim, and this is in 1943. Uh, this is especially when we actually look at the demographics, the East Coast. This is long before the Nation of Islam had actually had any presence in this particular area. As Omar Mubarak, uh, mashallah, my Haji brother mentioned that it was in 1961, and he actually uh, had, had shared that story with me earlier in his life that he had actually went and listened to uh, Elijah Muhammad uh, and, and heard his message and so forth. And, uh, and uh, he didn't actually uh, gravitate towards that. So we're talking about in 1943, where Professor S.D. Muhammad, as we saw in the backdrop six years prior, had defended Islam. He had rebuked the papers for trying to call them Negro Muslims. Uh, he had actually uh, is, is, is explained the Aqidah and so forth. So he was actually the pivotal point for the outcome of Sunni Islam in America. Yeah. And Subhana, I know that you had a, a relationship too as a as a young man uh, with uh, Sheikh Dawood Faisal, 
So can you kind of talk about your relationship, you know, with Sheikh Dawood Faizu? Um, I think you mentioned that you were about 18 years yes, old yes. Uh, yes. when you had, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually had that relationship with him. Yes, my, my father, uh, Haji Sham Jabba, rahimullah, uh, as when he became the national imam for the Dino Lahi University Arabic Association, uh, would take, you know, his sons with them to all of the different units and all the different massages. As, as children, so we was introduced to these uh, our 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 sheikhs, masheikhs, our imams, our leaders, our pioneers at a very early age. Um, and I, I moved to New York uh, in my teenage years, you know, in my studies, so forth and so on. I used to uh, frequent the masjid on State Street, uh, you know, and uh, that was the first uh, member that I gave khutbah at the age of 18 when Sheikh Dawood. Uh, was his health was failing and so forth and so on and he requested me to do the khutbah there so I became a part of that rotation in, 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 in my adult life alhamdulillah uh, had a very very uh, good relationship with him a very humble man I knew his wife uh, Um Khadija uh, a very very beautiful people very sincere uh, trying to to make Islam you know a, a universal expression uh, you know being in, in inclusive and and that was something that was unique with the AUAA that our Islam was not a racialized Islam. It was not marginalized. It, it facilitated any Muslim that actually uh, believed in the Quran and the Sunnah who followed the dictates of Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was something that was unique. And through my father's relationship, my, uh, Sheikh Dawa Faisal, he, uh, he trusted me to get on the member to deliver the Friday sermon, alhamdulillah. And, um, Imam Ali, if you can, you know, we're concluding the program, um, just give us some final reflections um, about um, the program um, this evening, the pioneers of Sunni Islam, you know, in, in America, 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, so we only got through the 30s and, and the 40s. So part two, inshallah, we're going to continue from the 40s, you know, to the, to the 50s, inshallah. So please stay tuned for, for part two. Uh, so, but just, before we, you know, we conclude and take some questions, um, Imam Ali, if you can give us some some final reflections, inshallah. Now, I just like to, in closing, uh, mention the fact that the three individuals you mentioned, uh, Sheikh Imam Wali Akram and uh, Sheikh uh, Dawood Faisal, and of course uh, Sheikh uh, Ezzeddin, Muhammad Ezzeddin, Allah Yarhamahum. Um, they were dynamic in their own right. Uh, Wali Akram was a tremendous influence and, and, and brought many people in, in Ohio into Islam. Also, we know the, the, the mission here in, in Brooklyn that it was an international uh, uh, masjid and you got a chance to meet people from all over the world, uh, which one of the, that reflects the personality and the understanding of Islam from Sheikh uh, Dawood, who also had a book. He wrote a book on Islam, explaining the Arakans and the, the different tenets and practices of Islam, and was accepted throughout the world. It was just not just here. And with that, with, with, uh, of course, you know, uh, the, the dean was a bit older, but if you're looking at what, what impact and how many people came to Islam through those people, and then the other generation coming now, Wahhab Abu Bakr, Hisham Jabba, and others, yeah. that generation continued on. So in terms of the Sunni Islam, in terms of uh, uh, the Muslim, uh, these people had a tremendous, they brought many, many I know my father, Hisham Jabba, Allah he, he brought, I don't know how many shahad that he gave from, you know, not just in America, but also in South Africa and his travels and so forth like that. But I know just here in Elizabeth alone, yeah. you know, half the town he gave, uh, or if not all, all of them, and I gave the rest, shahada. But those three individuals that you mentioned should stick with all of you, and, and hopefully we can give you more information regarding them as time goes on, as the program goes on, inshallah. But there's still some stories to be told. And this is, you know, definitely the legacy lives on. And, and this is going to be, uh, I believe, the topic, you know, for... Uh, our part two, you know, the legacy lives on. And after the passing of Professor um, Ezzedine in 1957, uh, that uh, some years later, once they kind of regrouped as an organization, my grandfather, uh, Sheikh Hisham Jabba, he became the national imam of Adin Allah Universal uh, uh, Arabic Association. And up under that banner, 
he performed the Janaza for our brother in Islam, our fallen martyr, uh, Al Hajj Malik Al Shabazz, right? And this was a dawa effort, you know, to let the world know that there are indigenous Muslims upon Quran and Sunnah that rush to claim the body of Malcolm X, right? And they performed the Janaza. The, the ghusl, the shrouding, and, and the, the salat to janazah up under this banner. So this is the story, inshallah ta'ala, that we're gonna actually lead to um, in part two. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna end here. Um, we could probably take some questions, inshallah. So brother Amir, uh, again, jazakallah khair, you know, the director of America's Islamic Heritage Museum. We have a, 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 a huge relationship, you know, with brother Amir from Washington, D.C. He has uh, anytime I invite him to, to bring his traveling museum, you know, he's he's here, mashallah. So uh, we had a couple programs uh, together here in New Jersey, you know, very beautiful display, right, of telling the story of the, the American Muslim. If you have not seen his exhibit, right, in Washington, D.C. On, on his website, it's a must-see, right? If you have not visited, it's, it's, it's a place that you definitely need to actually go. So Brother Amir, Jazakallah here for preserving preserving this history of, uh, of the American Muslim, alhamdulillah. So we'll turn it over to you, uh, Brother uh, uh, Amir, inshallah. Um, I, if there's some questions, um, maybe on Facebook, if you know our, our audience have any questions, inshallah, Tyler, we can definitely address those questions at this time. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, bil amin. Thank you, Brother Yusuf. Um, thank everyone um, for the information. Um, I, I just have, a, 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 I guess, a few questions. May Allah uh, uh, bless us with some insight and some guidance. And one is, my, is, is going to go to, uh, I believe it's Brother uh, Muhammad. You, you, you spoke of uh, Hamedic and Asiatic. Um, I, I want to elaborate on that uh, a, a little bit because what you see in early American history, Amazing. you know, not only no, Noble Drew Ali or the Morris Science Temple carrying on that banner and that concept, and but you also country. have the Nation of Islam, uh, that banner and that concept, Asiatic, you know, as well as uh, Professor El Zadine in the community, you know, why everybody carrying on and tying with yeah. the Hamedic um, okay. concept in there. And, 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 I, and I appreciated your elaborate, uh, uh, your discussion and, and, and tying it in. Okay. So, and, so, and um, that so we're going to have to uh, then after that, I do want to ask a question to Haj uh, Daoud, but go ahead. Brother. Okay. So um, the first question in regards to the, the identity, um, Hermetic um, Arab or the, you know, the Asiatic, you know, um, I guess uh, black man, you know, you have like these organizations like uh, More Science Temple, even um, Nation Islam, you know, what was so significant uh, about identifying themselves with, uh, with this particular identity? Even you have um, groups like the Five Percenters, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of identify with these, you know, the Asiatic black man, you know, what was so significant and important about that? Uh, one of the reasons why the, going back to the Moorish Science Temple, they identify with the Asiatic black man or uh, uh, people of that particular region because what happened with the uh, transatlantic slave trade and uh, colonialism, uh, Africa itself uh, became the actual uh, identification for people of dark complexion. You know, all people that had black skin was assigned to the concept of Africa. However, the great civilizations that, that we know that existed uh, were not only confined within Africa, but they were also in Arabia, because at that time, continentally, Arabia was considered Asia. So they, when we hear the word Asia today, we're talking about the Far East, we're talking about beyond Arabia. But at that particular time, if you look at the classical maps, Asia, it's uh, Arabia actually was situated inside of, uh, of Asia. So in order for us to reclaim our divine heritage from, from, from uh, Ismail, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, or uh, any of those great civilizations, Sheba, the, the, the people of Bilqis, the land of, of Kush, et cetera, we had to actually claim 
not only our African identity, but also the, the Arabian identity as well. And that's what they mean by the Asiatic black man, because according to the classical maps, Asia started from the Nile River and into the Euphrates. So Asia and Africa actually was share the same landmass. So in, to okay. be inclusive in claiming all of that, you had to go back because if we did not uh, claim the, the, the Asiatic uh, component of our, our, our history, then all those tribal societies that actually transferred over into Africa would have been lost. So that was the reason why they gravitated towards that. Not the Asia that we know today, but Asia as being Arabia and Africa sharing the same landmass. Okay, if I may be, if I may translate, my understanding of what you're saying is that that taking on that heritage of Abraham, who married a, 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 a who was Semitic, who married a Hamitic person, Hagar, and they had Ishmael, who was Hamitic in Asia, right? And then Abraham married another African or Hamitic person, a Qatar, and they had children, which was also breathed out of that Asiatic relationship. Am I not correct? Okay, so it's, um, let me just read the state the um, question. Uh, so going back to Abraham, uh, is it is it connected that, I guess that title, uh, Asiatic, you know, black male, Arab, you know, connected to Abraham because he's married to, because he married to um, Hagar, mm -hmm. um, and she's from, you know, Egypt, um, and also Hamura. Uh, which is considered hermetic. Mm -hmm. So is it because of this relationship um, that they kind of go back to that that particular term? Well, it, it would be a reason for them to go back if they want to uh, claim their, their, their total heritage. But however, when we look at the concept of Africa itself is new. And if we if we use Africa, if we bring Africa in the modern term, you know, then we're going to lose the history because Africa, there's, there was no place in classical uh, 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 history that defined Africa as an identity or actually a landmass. Africa was a small part of the, of the continent today in the north, okay? And everything beyond the uh, Nile River to the, uh, the northwest was considered uh, Libya, okay? And beyond the Nile to the east, that was Asia. So actually, Ibrahim salam and Hajar salam were actually considered a part of the Asian continent. You see, so if we as people of color of hermetic descent uh, do not cross over and claim the Asiatic component of our history, then we're going to lose our divine heritage. So yes, part and partial, Hagar and and and, and uh, Abraham is a part of that legacy. However, but if you study the history of Hagar, she herself was a part of the conquest of the Hyksos who went into what we call Misra or Egypt at that particular time. And when the original indigenous Kemetic or Hermetic people regained their, their sovereignty, mm -hmm. they actually went into a subjected state. But she herself was actually of the Arab descent prior to her, her, her people being subdued by the original Hermetic people. So all of that inclusive of our, as our heritage. And what happened is when we actually uh, take the narrative of what we call the contemporary narrative of colonialism, we're actually limited to what we call Black Africa, which is only about 44 states because 23 states of uh, 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 in the outer world. Yes. So when we say Africa, where does Africa begin and where does Africa end? So in order for us to actually regain and understand the identity, we have to go to the classics because the modern uh, contemporary scholars have worked diligently to take away the heritage, land grabbers, colonize the continent and created the Middle East and the misinformation that people on the other side of the Red Sea are, 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 are actually ethnically different from those people on the other side of the Red Sea when they're actually the same social yeah. groups. And um, brother, I know we have a question in the chat. Can you mind if I just take this question, inshallah? Yes. Oh, so um, Imam Ali, so the questioner, he's asking, uh, or she's asking, uh, what role did Sufism play in the formation of the AA, UAA and early groups? And was there any specific tariqa? There may have been uh, people who uh, was associated individually with some groups, but the AAUAA, the Dino Lahi Universal Arabic Association, uh, main focus was reconnecting people back to true Islam uh, identity. And there was no room, there's no evidence 
uh, or documentation that, that points out or points to any uh, practices of Sufism or the tariqah or the tasawwuf. These things were not present or prevalent. Uh, like I said, an individual may have some association or, 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 or temporarily or even, you know, came from that. But um, it's a point, I, I, something is very important that Sheikh Muhammad mentioned that goes along with what I'm saying. See, Father Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah granted him a nation, a nation of believers. A nation who surrendered their will to the will of Allah. That includes Bilqis. Bilqis says, I submit along with Suleiman to the Lord of the world. So the heritage we're talking about, the divine component to that is that we are all believers. Even now, we're talking about people who their legacy is la ilaha illallah and the Muhammad Rasulullah, that we are Muslim. That's number one. That's what we, we all have uh, benefited from, is that all this whole journey, it brings us back to the legacy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Bilat al-Ibrahim, that, that gave to Ismail, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until now. So, so, so what I'm saying is basically, uh, we, we have to really understand the purpose in what Allah created us and, and, and the, the road and the path that he's given us and where we are today. And that is that we are Muslim. Jazakallah. And then one, one more question to, from the chat. What books were taught at the School of Wisdom? Uh, and, the, and this is in, in uh, I guess, the, the 30s, the late 30s, yeah. early 40s. Um, I, I can speak from my experience, you know, as a, 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 a youth. Um, the education of the Adinu Lahi Universal Arabic Association was universal. What was taught in Unit A was taught in Unit B. And Professor Ezzedine, Rahimullah, had prescribed and, and, and outlined a curriculum of study. Uh, so when we would go to the, the, the all of the Darul Hikmah was actually the educational uh, 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 facility. So what happened is that when we would go to the village and study Islam, you know, we would study the, the, the five pillars of Islam. We would study the Arabic language. We would recite the Quran. We made the Salah as we pray today, as the Prophet Sallallahu prayed. And Professor Ezzedine Muhammad, he did not uh, come forward as the leader of the Muslims. It was by consensus that he became their leader. He was not uh, a, a wali or someone who came with a tariqah. It was by consensus of a, 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 a group effort, a group election that, that put him in that position. And he always allowed each unit to manage themselves, to get, have their own imams, to, to progress based on their means and so forth and so on. However, we did have a national assembly. We had a, a national imam. So there was nothing inside of, of, of the teachings of Adinu Lahi Universal Arabic Association that was actually different from Kitab Allah was Sunnah today. And I remind you that Professor Adin Muhammad was educated in Al Ashar. So he definitely understood you know, the diversities of, of, and the differences of Islam because Ashar itself is a university, uh, it's, 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 it's very, very diverse, uh, and all the sciences, all the different groups are discussed there. And that is what led up to the, 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 uh, the conference of bringing all the Muslims together to get them off of the different uh, 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 path that was actually not consistent with the Kabbalah and the Sunnah. And I mentioned earlier that uh, Sheikh Dawood Faisal was actually a muqaddim for the Sufi uh, Wali uh, uh, Ahmed Alawi before he met Professor Ezzedine. So we have no elements of uh, Tasawwuf inside of our practice, inside of our education. What we, what we, what we, did, we studied the classic text the fiqh, as, uh, uh, as you mentioned earlier, was says Yusuf, that the position of Sheikh uh, Azuddin was that of the Hanbali, uh, the Hanifi uh, fiqh, that the Quran or the khutbah itself had to be delivered in the Arabic language. So his orientation was, was deep rooted in classic Islam as opposed to the type of uh, the, you know, diversities that we are faced with. I'll right take now. a second just to add to what yeah, he said. To father, to father, there, there are many of your guests may be able to speak to this, but he had he had uh, classic books of Islamic teachings. And from al Azhar University there, I don't know whether or not they preserved his library, but most of the materials that he had was classic based on uh, Quran and Hadith and books of fiqh uh, uh, were classic. We may still have some of those around if yeah. some of the uh, 
some of the uh, guests may know that, but uh, but most of his uh, curriculum was drawn from accept acceptable books even today from uh, the classic works of Islam. And then we have a question about how many units were there uh, up under AA UAA? They vary. Oh, well, they 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 opened you know and and they expanded and some of them uh, actually uh, broke away and got their own autonomy. Like for example, we had a unit in Philadelphia. Uh, actually, Pennsylvania, uh, Sheikh Ahmed, uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed Nasser, uh, he was the uh, uh, imam there uh, under Professor Azim Muhammad. However, uh, as time you know unfolded, he actually uh, uh, broke away and established uh, his own uh, 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 institution. And one thing that we, we have to remind ourselves that these breakaways was was not hostile. They was not, but they were still uh, affiliated with the AUA. It's just that. The, the plans in which they had laid forth to be best, you know, executed and orchestrated by members in that in that immediate environment. Sheikh Dawood Faisal, uh, Rahmanullah, always kept a close association with uh, uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Muhammad Azadeen. You know, we 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 visit those units, so forth and so on. So I wouldn't say that that uh, there was a uh, breakaways in the negative sense, but there was expansion. And, and, and at the same time, you know, we kept the unity. And Professor Ezzedine Muhammad was always a key figure in all of those groups. Yeah. And I know too that I mean, and we mentioned Hamilton, Hamilton, uh, uh, New Jersey. Yes, it was two in Newark. Uh, two in Newark. Yeah. Uh, we had um, um, in New York. We had yeah. seventeen. Two, yeah. two, yeah. So active. it was like about seventeen units. Active. Um, in, in Ohio um, and also Florida. So it was about seventeen units. Um, units um, total up under the uh, the banner of AUAA. Yeah. So um, Brother Amir, we're going to hand it back to you. I know you have a question as well. And just let us know, inshallah, with our time. And we want to, before we end, we have a uh, special guest uh, poet, inshallah, time just leaves us some, with some poetry um, before we end the program. So let us know how we, I'm going to turn it over, inshallah, Tyler. you can take over the moderation. So whenever you say stop, Shalom, but I'm not gonna take so. over the moderation. I just want to talk to Sheikh Dawood. I got a couple questions for uh, uh, Mom Dawood. If you unmute with him, they're gonna give it to you, man. Uh, I saw Dawood, you. You're still there, right? Yeah. Wa alaikum salam wa Alhamdulillah, my brother. I um, you we cut you off a little bit because I know you had a little thought, and brother keeps saying part two. But I'm an old guy, man. I ain't promised tomorrow. So please share with us what you got to share with us today at this moment, this time. Okay, please. Um, because really, you you are you've been a part of uh, uh matter of fact, what is it, 325 acres? You've been under control. Most com communities, every organization that I'm aware of that's been a part of America had aspiration to try to establish community life. And set up communities, and and, and y'all did it. What well, I I can't count too quick, but at least 50, 60s, whatever it is, seventy years ago. Yeah, no, we yeah yeah seventy plus years ago, you know, mm -hmm. and still maintain it. So one of my questions would be if you could address, what are y'all doing on the eight on the on on the land that is producing to help help self maintain? What and what are some of the needs or aspirations? That you um, that you like to share with us. Go for it, my brother. Alhamdulillah, uh, to, 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 to be absolute, to be frank, what we're doing now, we are, are restructuring. Our goal now is to rebuild the masjid. You know, the land right now is is fairly desolate. All the elders the elders have passed away, and the second generations have pretty much you know abandoned the post. And so uh, the contingent in, in, uh, on, in Buffalo, it, it still meets, it's, you know, it's still strong. And uh, we have a meeting actually coming up in April to try to uh, come up with a, a plan. We, our, our plan, our idea is to reestablish the professor's idea of national homeland. You know, uh, we see what's going on you know, in the society today. We see what's happening to our children. And so uh, the original idea to have farms, to have uh, to raise halal meat, to have a factory, you know, a plant uh, for slaughtering meat, and, and to have uh, activities, especially in the summer, you know, uh, conventions and so forth. And so, on. so 
so uh, that's the basic idea right now is to 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 come back together. There was some legal, there was some illegal issues going on because you see the 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 land out there it has it it was a unit it had its own board, its own you know autonomy within the within the community. So there were a few issues, but now inshallah we think we've come to a resolution, and uh, you know we're ready to to revitalize the land. Inshallah, be in love with the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Because uh, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of land. I, you know, I'm I, I I'm late. When I when I when I came in, the land had already been in there. They 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 had been out there for 40 years. You know, when I when I uh, got involved in the 70s, and so uh, we we took up the land. At that time, the community was thriving. We had people coming from all over the country and even from outside of the country. Uh, people coming from New Jersey, from New York City, to take residence. And uh, again, uh, most of the staunch people, they, they have passed away and we have a younger generation. Uh, we really appreciate uh, Yusuf, you know, uh, and your generation. I have one son on here. Uh, my same, you see my name twice, well, the other one is, is my son, you know. Uh, yeah, we're looking to the younger generation to, to join hands with us and try to rebuild what the elders uh, started, you know, more than 50 years ago. Possibly Muslim summer resort, winter's resort. Yes. Uh, uh, taking um, um, students out. Um, we need to learn the market, help produce, you know, make it historical, you know, no. uh, come. Yeah. You know, we got to learn yes. how to market uh, uh, our history and, and our heritage. And uh, as, as the kids say today, we got to make it rain. We got to make, we got to generate some funding. You'll make some noise, yeah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But I'll be in there by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, it, it, you know, he has preserved it over all this time. You know, we're looking at 85 years now, uh, you know, since the uh, establishment, you know, of this land-based community. And uh, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it and he wants it to continue. So uh, we really feel that it's time for those people who understand this history that we're talking about, understand the goals and aspirations and the baraka. I think that's the key word, baraka. There's baraka that's been inherent in the organization uh, from uh, from those times until now. You know, uh, I mentioned a few. You know, my teachers, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. You know, Hadji uh, Sham Jabba, who I had the had the the uh, great. Uh, pleasure in Baraka of being able to spend 40 days with him back in 1978, along with along with Muhammad, you know, uh, in Naperville, Illinois, which was very beneficial to me. Uh, you know, that's that's before I became an Imam of Jabal Arabia, and uh, the the information and knowledge that I got from him was very essential. A big part of what I do for them. Which was very beneficial to me. Uh, you know, but that's that's before I became a man with Jabal Arabia. And uh the, the information now that I got from him was very I think we're getting some feedback if yeah, some feedback. Can, um... so I, I, I think that's our note. So I'm gonna close out. I see. Uh, um, just one brother. more thing. We're gonna um, end with some poetry, inshallah. Inshallah. Just yeah, uh, a couple brother, minutes. Hands up, so I'm gonna... Yes, and then we we end up, inshallah. So um, at this moment, uh, we have um, uh, Ibrahim Muhammad Hisham Jabra, and he's gonna do some poetry, inshallah, Taala, for us, and then we'll close out with dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, this poem is entitled "New Ark." Um, it's a historical journey um, of Islam um, being stripped away and then reclaimed. Inshallah Taala. <clears throat> it was the exodus unexpected at foreign hands. It was the inescapable escape to the promised land. It was forty years in the wilderness of wandering. It was the destruction of the Temple of Solomon. It was Moses trying to get the sea to part again. It read like scripture, but stripped of its origins. They brought us in on ships like sheep for the slaughtering. The son of Abraham, the offering. Joseph taken from his father, then sold into bondage by his brethren. But Judah was Britain and Africa was Simeon. 
The pit that they put us in is what we're living in 400 years until they made us citizens, African American, cargo on a caravan, try walking on water from Mali all the way to Maryland. In the beginning, it was too dark. Black eyes and bruised hearts. The South was too harsh, so they moved north like Noah, looking for a new start, a new home, a new ark. But how strong are you and how long can you walk being stalked by Jim Crow Pharaoh on the road to New York? And he was known to use force for some Freedom was just an afterthought. What about the past we lost and the paths we crossed? We had language, lineage, and land cut off, stranded like vagabonds without a path to travel on. They took away the shackles and sent us back to Babylon, the darkness waiting to embrace us with open arms. We had to scratch our way out of oblivion just to live again. Moses on the way to Midian, too black to blend in with the Indians. We had had to claw our way out of the darkness and the ignorance. Who are we? Where do we come from? What is our genesis? No religion, no relation, no resemblance. So how do we find our way back to his remembrance? Before they knew they were Moors, in fact, they knew they were more than black, more than slave, more than savage, more than three fifths of a man. They knew they had a creator and they knew he had a plan. And so this is where their search began. They traced the names of their grands back to their native lands, back to Morocco, Mali, Senegal, and Sudan with hands like maps and faces like Fulan. They took the scraps that remained and reclaimed their nations and clans and became the Canaanites, the Moors, the nation of Islam, the Arabs, the Muslims upon the faith of Abraham from Drew Ali to Haji Hisham, Professor Azuddin and everyone between. Many changed their language and reclaimed their dreams, had Arabic tongues like name, with names like El Amin, Shabazz, Malik, Wali, Hakim, took the top hats from their heads and instead they rocked the red crown, the fez, the women covered from the neck down to their legs. And from there, word began to spread. Islam would come to Newark piece by piece. It wasn't always perfect, but at least they found a place of retreat, built mosque in the city facing the east, turned storefronts to temples and started waking the sheep from the corners of every street on soap boxes and step ladders or wherever they could preach. There was poverty and discrimination. There were people flooded with grief. And so Newark became a new ark for people searching for peace. Alhamdulillah, uh, so alhamdulillah, though, that, that's, that concludes our program this evening. Uh, again, I would thank Brother Amir, uh, the America's Islamic um, Heritage uh, Museum, and also our, um, uh, our guests uh, and our uh, distinguished panelists, uh, alhamdulillah, and our audience for, for tuning in. Uh, please make sure that, you know, uh, you go to the website and look at uh, what the museum has to offer. And also this recording is, uh, is it was streamed on Facebook. So please share it with your family and friends that uh, are curious about this, um, this rich Islamic um, history. Uh, and we will keep everyone informed, um, inshallah ta'ala, with part two um, of um, this history, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adabina. ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وعفونا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا وانصرنا على قوم الكافرين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك ونشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت ونستغفرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحيم والعوص إن الإنسان لا في خص إلا الذين من وعمل الصالحات وتواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته